In our Bible study, it's an opportunity to connect with friends in a meaningful way. The study discussions bring us deeper understanding of each other as well as the richness of the Bible stories recorded and told through the ages. I'm feeling so amazingly grateful for the group that is larger and smaller sometimes, has come to talk about the climate emergency, about environmental injustice. We came to listen and connect with each other and to choose an initiative to work on together. It's meant the world to me. It's quite remarkable. It's really also been one of the great pleasures of my life. All of us in the group share this desire, huge hunger to learn, but also to, to feel like we're taking some action. It has been a big source of, of spiritual companionship. We really, truly listen to each other without judgment. We are really there for each other and we're, we're very different people. And I think we really appreciate how e uniquely different we are. The King's Chapel Friday night block parties have been so meaningful to me. It's been a great chance to hear from various committees. And in addition to that, it's just been a wonderful way to catch up with fellow King's Chapel members, to see what's going on in everyone's lives and to stay in touch. We have so much to be grateful for this homecoming season. One of the things I like the best is Monday music meditations. Three minutes of beautiful music and gorgeous photography, all wrapped up in a wonderful presentation with our choir, with our fantastic organ, with Heinrich at the helm. Um, sometimes it's folk songs, sometimes spirituals, sometimes classical. It's all wonderful. I'm really thankful to come to morning prayer every Sunday. I feel fed by it. I love the music. I love hearing the word. It makes me feel very connected to God and to my fellow parishioners, and I'm very thankful for it. I'm so grateful for Morning Light at King's Chapel each week. I've only joined since we've been meeting virtually, but it has become a really central grounding moment in my week. When our ministers create a sacred space for us to gather and reflect on the week's message, and then we take a generous time being present with one another in our sorrows and our joys and joining together in a communion of prayer. I feel held in community and also feel glad to be part of the holding. Faye has really been a wonder with the history program talks. It was fun to go deep and to hear more. As a girl, I adored the book Little Women, and I read it multiple times. So hearing that Louisa May Alcott had a family connection, the little child part of me felt really giddy about that. I go to Marmee's church. I had a particular fondness for the Thursday morning coffee with the ministers. It was a very informal and usually small group. Uh, chance to just chat, talk about whatever's on our mind. It was a great way to stay in touch and hopefully stay somewhat sane. One of the many things that I've enjoyed about King's Chapel since becoming a member about a year and a half ago is the Theology on Tap series. We can always count on David to lead us in a spirited discussion. Uh, the topics range from everything from close readings of scripture uh, to studying poetry, to reflecting on the themes of our sermons and their intersection with our daily lives. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Lord.
Dear friends, good morning. I'm David Waters, Minister for Education and Membership here at King's Chapel. Joy Fallon, our Senior Minister, and Heinrich Christensen, our Music Director, they join me in welcoming you to morning prayer on this, our Homecoming Sunday. This morning, we hear the story of how a weary, hungry people received manna from heaven during their hard journey through the desert, a story that surely resonates with us as we make our own journey through the desert of pandemic, racial injustice, economic uncertainty, and natural disaster. Today, we gather as a community of faith to celebrate the sustenance that we find even in the midst of our hardship, to gather in spirit and love, even as we are physically separated. We're so pleased to come to you from our beloved sanctuary this morning, even as work continues to restore and make our space ready for that time when we may gather in person once more. Some of our friends and members will help lead us in worship this morning, and we're especially excited by the return of choir members past and present for a rousing rendition of Swell the Full Chorus. Following the service, Heinrich will lead us in a live hymn sing, followed by breakout sessions that will give us a chance to connect with one another, much as we would following our service at coffee hour. Please stay with us following the service as we take this moment to delight in each other's company. And now we begin with our opening hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. Dear friends, welcome. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at King's Chapel. Believer or doubter, seeker or skeptic, we're all on this journey together. And on this journey together, we remember the words of Jesus to his disciples. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. In this moment, in whatever way we're able, let us be that peace for one another. Peace be with you. Let us say together the general confession.
Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Hear the words of God's promise. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, let us take heart. God will have mercy upon us, being penitent, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to everlasting life. And now, as Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised.
The Old Testament reading is from Exodus 16, verses 1 through 5 and 9 through 12. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from the oasis Elim, and in the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, Israel came to the wilderness, which is between Elim and Sinai. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from the heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, There on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Here ends the lesson. What sustains you? This sermon is about hard times and what nourishes you, sometimes in a completely unexpected form. This is the third of seven sermons taken from the Hebrew Bible story of Exodus about how God transformed a person and a whole nation, Moses and the whole Hebrew tribe, from the tragedy of slavery into a place of hope, the promised land. If you personally aren't in the place you'd like to be right now, or if you're concerned that our nation is not, then consider the Exodus lesson that has stood the test of time for 2,500 years and for billions of people who still find it true. Point one, God loves a complainer. Moses and Aaron aren't so thrilled with the people's complaints, but God, God never rebukes the complainers. God listens and gives the people what they need. God loves the complainer. The point runs counter to everything that we're taught. Don't be a crybaby. Hey, can't complain. By which we mean others have it worse. Many of you say that to me about prayers. Oh, others need them more. As if there's a quota on prayers or God has the bandwidth for only a few things and loathes a complainer. But it's not true. Our human aversion to complainers might be taught by your mother or mentor, but it's not a biblical rule. 
The Psalms are full of laments and even shocking slams on God. Where are you? And all the best prophets shout and shake their fists at God because life is hard. Sometimes just like being in a real wilderness when you're famished and sometimes just like a global pandemic that leaves no space safe. In these situations, God knows humans need to complain and ask for help. Not to exaggerate, not to be forever embittered or always casting blame on another, but because no one alone can handle the wilderness. We never were meant to. That's why the Bible is replete with human complaints because the Bible's all about humans' relationships with the divine and all real relationships presume honesty. The ability to say, this is rotten. I need help. I can't do it alone. In Exodus, the Hebrews complaint was legitimate. They were starving. Humans need food. So they told God exactly how hard life was and shook a fist at the holy. You too can lament, complain, tell God exactly how life is. You can shake a fist at God. God can take it. I learned this from a minister who was speaking about Alzheimer's that had afflicted her mother. With Alzheimer's, the speaker said, you will be angry, it's unfair. Let it out right at God. She then divided us up into twos and had us rant at each other for a few minutes. Since then, when I've met with people with terrible diseases and they are angry, maybe at God, I've urged them to rant loud and long and even with a clenched fist. Faith imbued people can, those with less sure foundations won't. But if we're angry at God or the universe because of unfairness or injustice, there are only two options, walk away from God entirely or confront God. You owe it to your soul to at least try confronting God. It requires you for that moment to act as if some force of compassion will listen. And what's the worst that can happen? You could get no answer and then you walk away. God loves a complainer. This is a get out of jail free card. Use it. That first point is connected to my second one. What you get that it's not always look like what you asked for. In Exodus, the people asked for rye or challah, but they got little white flakes on the ground. Manna, they asked. That's Hebrew for what is it? To the hungry, starving people, God sent bread. But what they got was not at all what they'd expected. They needed Moses to be their interpreter. It's bread from heaven, he tells them. Often we need an interpreter or a new way of seeing when checking out whether God answers our prayers. Otherwise, we could completely overlook the nourishment right in front of us because it doesn't come in the package we anticipate. You know the story, a, a fellow was stuck on his rooftop in a flood, praying to God for help, and soon a man in a rowboat comes, jump in, I can save you, he says to the man on the roof. Stranded fellow shouts back, oh no, it's okay, God is gonna save me. Next, a motorboat comes by, the same thing, and then a helicopter pilot shouts down, grab this rope and I'll lift you to safety. The stranded man again replies, I'm praying to God and he is going to save me. I have faith. Soon the water rises above the rooftop. The stranded man drowns. And in heaven, he asks God, why did you let me drown? God answers, I sent you a rowboat, a motorboat, and a helicopter. What more did you expect? What we get does not always come in the packaging we expect. In my own life, when I was in my 40s, I just felt done, done with my father still trying to perfect me. And I talked at length with my minister, who at about minute 55 of our hour together said this. Joy, your father is a born teacher. It's how he shows his love through teaching. It's the mode he knows. Love is coming to you from him, but not in the package you want. Focus on the love he's sending, not the packaging. 
This pandemic is awful. Having to be at home coming by Zoom is not what we want, but it's what we're getting. Rather like all those boats and the helicopter. And what we have can be as life-giving as the little flakes of manna were, although that manna looked. What if the Hebrew people had refused to eat the manna because it was something different than what was comfortable and understood by them? The creator of all life means to provide us with what we need always. Look for the manna. Point three. Did you notice the odd timetable on which the manna arrived? The good news, it came by overnight deliveries without even having to pay for prime six days a week. But the bad news, the manna lasted only one day. If you tried to collect more than you needed, it spoiled an ugly, stinking, inedible mess. This was not a good system for any of us who love efficiency. Far better to go to the manna grocery once a week than run back and forth every single day. Nor was it great for strategic folks. Far better to get enough toilet paper than be without. I mean, isn't hoarding wise? even if others don't get their portion. But love, named God, apparently thought the Hebrew people might need some retraining after their time in slavery. In a system that gave everything to the Pharaoh and only leftover scraps to the slaves. That system had instilled the value of grabbing what you could, even secreting it away. So love, out in the wilderness, was teaching a people slowly, day by day, to trust that they'd get enough for the day enough. The preferred packaging might be a huge storehouse full coming, but they'd have enough. Give us this day our daily bread. Love also was teaching them that on the seventh day they should rest because on the sixth day they got twice as much as they needed. The Hebrews hadn't yet gotten the Ten Commandments up on Mount Sinai. We're still early in the Exodus story. But notice that already they're given this ability once a week that they could sleep in on the next day. They could rest, remember that they had what they needed, give thanks to the one who provided it. In World War II, children who had been orphaned had trouble sleeping at night, given all the terror they had experienced. Caregivers in one orphanage found that these little children could fall asleep if they were each given a baguette, a loaf of bread to sleep with, hugging it through the night. Because then the children knew that they'd have enough food to survive the next day. Enough. Right now, we're all people in the wilderness. Our routines are gone. You may not even know what day of the week it is, part of the time. In a usual year, we take homecoming as a kickoff for a new program year at church, a time to recommit to church routines after summer. I suggest that even this year, maybe especially this year, to use today to recommit to this church, to a daily practice of some kind that reminds you of the holy, and to the weekly practice of worship, to know and rest God is in our midst, and that we have a whole community on the journey with us. That's what you've told us you need. Not another place for purely social gatherings, but a place to build or rebuild your spiritual lives. You might wanna work on a voter drive or on climate change, but not just because those issues matter, and they do, but because when you do it through the church, you do so with others who are inspired by compassion for the whole world, all God's children. You come to find values that run deeper than money or worldly success. A place here where we can value the dignity of every person and grow in relationship to the eternal. That's the old, old story of Exodus. It was true then, and it's true now. Thanks be to God. Oh,
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon all ministers of the gospel and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for thine infinite mercy's sake, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all humankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of thy people, that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for the good estate of thy holy church, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit that all who profess and call themselves Christians and all those who seek thee by any other name may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy goodness all those who are in any way afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, and especially thy servants, Pam Bergeron, Elizabeth Thompson, Wadad Ayad, Jessica Schmidt, Howard Chadwick Jr., Rachel Corey, George Corey, Dottie Kronstein, Daniel Wirth, Clark Allen, D. Clark, Chenga, Robert Gupton, Elizabeth, Carl Henning, Jim, Mateo, Michael. We pray for all those affected by COVID-19, for all those who have died and those who mourn them, for all those who are ill and those who care for them. We pray for all those suffering racial injustice and violence, and for all those engaged in the long, hard work of equity and justice for all people. We pray for those communities in the Gulf Coast devastated by Hurricanes Laura and Sandy, for those in the western states ravaged by wildfires, and for all those suffering the effects of a changing climate around the world. We pray for those struggling with unemployment and economic hardship. We pray for the families of the recently departed Chief Justice Ralph Gantz and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that they may know healing and peace as they mourn and for all those whom we hold up to thee in silent prayer. May it please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all of their afflictions. And this we humbly ask as disciples of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, 
Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we may show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we ascribe unto thee all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and has promised by thy beloved Son that where two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord keep all those whom you love, whether here or in some other place. May God be your companion and you be God's friend as you walk together through all the days of your life. And at the journey's end, may you find the welcome of God's love. It keeps us all. Amen. Oh, so far.